Happy Monday, everyone, and happy May Day. Thanks for tuning in to another Planetarium live stream. Uh, welcome, welcome. I am your Planetarium manager, Patrick Hess, and I'm here to take you on a tour of our seasonal night sky, uh, as well as take a look at some uh, current events going on in the world of space and astronomy exploration. Thank you to everyone tuning in tonight. I know everybody is still recovering from the NFL draft hosted right here in downtown Kansas City this weekend. So whoever is tuning in tonight, I really appreciate you watching tonight. And let us know that you're watching. Let us know where you're watching from. That way things uh, keep, are kept fresh and interesting. And it keeps me company for the next hour. We've already got Tammy, one of our longtime watchers and top fans, saying hello from cold Iowa. Uh, it's pretty chilly here in Kansas City as well, Tammy, but I hope it warms up soon, and it's always a pleasure seeing you. We've got Holly watching, saying woohoo right back at you, Holly. Hope you enjoy tonight's show. And we've got Sherry down the hall saying hello. Hope you enjoy tonight's show. Sherry, let me know if you have any questions. And to everybody watching tonight on May 1st, 2023 at 6 p.m. Central, uh, please uh, let us know where you're watching from and throw out a comment. Uh, this is a live stream. Uh, and I would love to hear uh, where you're watching from and if you have any questions. If you're a first-time watcher, welcome. Uh, and if you're a returning watcher, welcome back. We've done a bunch of live streams over the past few years. This is actually our 93rd live stream, which is pretty crazy. Uh, but if you've missed any past shows or are curious what we've been doing over the past couple of years, we do have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash kcplanetarium. I upload recordings of all of our past streams over there where we've done some deep dives into all sorts of topics about uh, our solar system and uh, much, much more. So check those out. We've got curated playlists for you there. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you're watching on Union Station's Facebook page, after the stream's over, we encourage you to go over to the Planetarium's Facebook page and subscribe to us there, where you'll uh, not miss all of our uh, exciting astronomy updates. Um, so uh, we got Terry who's watching from Florida. Thanks for tuning in tonight, Terry. I hope you enjoy tonight's show. We're going to jump right into it and keep things moving. So let's see what is up. Uh, we're going to take a tour of our night sky here in May, and we're going to look at current events over the past month. Um, a couple things. Oops, uh, out of order. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so um, first of all, just a quick update and announcement about the planetarium. We have been doing laser shows at the planetarium. Um, over the past month, and we're going to be doing more laser shows. Uh, we've had to work on some repairs to our main star projection system, uh, but we've got an amazing schedule of laser, sh laser shows lined up for you, uh, and those include uh, some family favorites like Peter and the Wolf, The Great Space Chase, A Brief Mystery of Time, all great uh, um, uh, shows, educational shows, and entertaining shows. And of course, we've got our laser concerts, Taylor Swift every day of the week, uh, as well as The Beatles, Stranger Things, Daft Punk, and Pink Floyd on weekends. So check out that schedule. Uh, let me uh, hide myself so you can see it fully there. Now we'll be returning at the end of May uh, and the beginning of uh, summer in June with our regular shows. Actually, I just got a shipment from France today uh, with some new equipment and computers, so we'll be installing that soon. Uh, once again, Laser Taylor Swift every day of the week. Uh, it is a fan favorite for sure. So again, there's our schedule. Open Tuesday through Sunday. We've got a bunch of people tuning in uh, and leaving comments, which I absolutely love. It's great seeing everybody. And if you're watching live on Monday, May 1st, then uh, give us a shout out in the comments. We've got Holly watching from Chandler, Arizona. Thanks for watching tonight, Holly. Elise is tuning in from Independence just uh, around the corner. Thanks for watching, Elise. We've got Jenny from Camdenton, Missouri. Thanks for watching tonight. Gabriella is watching from Davidson, Miss... I'm, I'm showing my my uh, lack of uh, knowledge of state abbreviations. Michigan. Uh, ooh, that's embarrassing. That's all right. Um, I always joke that my knowledge of the universe uh, starts at the upper atmosphere and goes up. Anything below that yeah, I don't know. So um, thanks for tuning in, Gabriella from Michigan. Cindy's uh, watching from Savannah, Missouri. Thanks for watching tonight, Cindy. And Jerry, another one of our top fans and longtime watchers, saying nice to see you again, Patrick. Nice to see you again, Jerry. And nice to see you every time. Casey is another longtime watcher as well. Cheers from the Northland. Thanks for watching tonight. And thank you so much for commenting. I know tonight's a lighter night, but it's so great to see everybody in the comment section uh, letting me know that I'm not just speaking into a black void. All right, so let's jump into our What's Up Star Tour. Let's see what is going on in our night sky here in May. And we're starting out 
on the lawn of the Liberty Memorial. Uh, who here was at the draft and actually watched the uh, NFL draft uh, from this view? Let us know in the comments. It was quite the experience. I tried to see, uh, see it on Friday, but I got there too late and they uh, locked me out. They reached capacity. I didn't know outdoors had a maximum capacity, but there you go. Um, but it was probably a pretty amazing view looking at the skyline and the NFL draft happening. A pretty historic event for Kansas City. Um, and you may even see the planetarium peeking out there from the trees. Uh, but we are not interested in our skyline or our daytime sky. We're interested in our nighttime sky. So let's check out what's going on in our night sky. Um, so we are looking at our daytime sky right now. And this is uh, uh, looking at our current time, so at about 6 p.m. Uh, and again, the Liberty Memorial at the World War I Museum is right behind us here towards the south. Uh, there's the sun, and the sun is going to be setting in a few hours. So, of course, we want to fast forward time and get rid of that sun. So let's move that sun out of the way. It'll go down below the horizon, and about 9 o'clock will be uh, when the stars start to appear. But if you want to go stargazing tonight, I'd recommend uh, waiting until about 9.30 when twilight kind of goes out of the way and the last uh, remainders of the daytime sky uh, disappear, and you'll be able to see our beautiful sky. So here on the lawn, looking north over Union Station, we can see the North Star. This is uh, the star, the only star in our northern skies that stays in the same place all night. Um, so its name is Polaris uh, right there, and that's because it's directly above the North Pole. And if I fast forward again, you'll see that throughout the night, all the stars will actually rotate around the North Star. Just, and that's because the Earth rotates around the North Pole. So relative to the stars as the Earth rotates, uh, the stars will stay in this, or this star, Polaris, will stay in the same place relative to the Earth. Uh, but we want to rewind back to 9.30 uh, for our star tour. Oops. Uh, let's see here. All right, so 9.30. Um, now, Polaris, that star, is part of a star pattern called the Little Dipper, uh, which looks like a little spoon. That star, is, uh, Polaris, is at the end of the handle of the Little Dipper. Uh, we can see the handle there uh, with the scoop of the spoon. And we can throw up the stars there. Now, it's part of an official constellation called Ursa Minor, which means the little bear. Uh, there is a big bear nearby, uh, which is called Ursa Major, and it has the big dipper. You can imagine a similar spoon shape here with the scoop and the handle. And these two constellations are visible year-round here in Kansas City. We call them circumpolar because as the sky spins around, they are always visible and they're always circling the pole, uh, which is where Polaris is. So you can always see these constellations in the sky, uh, and you can use Ursa Minor and Polaris to locate your directions at nighttime. We're going to move on and look over towards the western sky, where there's a fun constellation setting this season called Gemini the Twins. This one is a uh, constellation that's part of the Zodiac, which is a group of 12 constellations commonly associated with astrology. Astrology sounds like astronomy, but uh, it's actually just a fun hobby. There's no science to it. Astronomy is the science, and astrology uh, is, like I said, a fun hobby for some people. Some people use it to try to predict things about people, like your horoscope or your personality. But it's based on real constellations, and one of those is Gemini the Twins. Uh, this one is fun and easy to spot. Looks like two stick figures holding hands. Uh, these two bright stars are the stick figures' heads. And here's one head, is body, arms, and legs... Here's the other head, his body, arms, and legs. And we can throw up the constellation there. These twins were named Castor and Pollux, and they were a legendary pair of Greek heroes. The brightest stars in this constellation uh, are named Castor and Pollux as well. By the way, we've got a couple more people in the comment section uh, chiming in. We've got John, who's saying hello. Thanks for watching tonight, John. Hope you're having a good night. Uh, and taking a well-deserved break from, I'm sure, what was a crazy weekend. Jerry says the live streams are well worth watching. I appreciate you, Jerry. And even if you're the only one watching, it would be worth it to me, too. All right, so we're looking at Gemini. Now, Gemini is an uh, interesting constellation, but there is an interesting thing inside of Gemini right now, and it's a bright point of light that you might have noticed wasn't part of the constellation. And if you look closely, you might notice that this point of light looks a little bit different than the stars around it. 
For example, look at how these stars are sort of faintly twinkling. Now, it might be kind of hard to see, but hopefully in the stream you can see the stars are twinkling, just like they do in the real night sky. And uh, the reason stars twinkle is because stars are so far away from Earth that by the time a distant star's light reaches our planet, only a tiny amount of it is able to pass through the Earth's dense atmosphere, and our atmosphere causes that little speck of light to become distorted, making it appear to wobble and twinkle. But not every object in our night sky will be twinkling, and there is a bright red point of light in Gemini that is not twinkling. This object is much closer than distant stars, so more of its light is reflected back towards Earth, and it looks like a wider disk of light. And using our virtual planetarium and a telescope, we can zoom right in on this object to see what it is. Uh, and that is the planet Mars. That's right, you can see a planet in our night sky tonight, and you can tell it's a planet because it's not twinkling. Uh, Mars, the red planet, is shining brightly uh, in our sky right now. And uh, you'll look for that red point of light. Um, now, uh, let's see. Now, Mars uh, is not always very bright, unfortunately. Mars will cycle in brightness as it gets closer or farther away from us. Uh, right now, though, is a decent time to view Mars. Uh, here is a chart showing uh, the distance from the Earth to Mars. And as you can see, it's uh, kind of in the middle. It's moving away from us, so it's getting dimmer. Uh, its closest approach was at the end of last year, but it is still visible. So look for that red point of non-twinkling light, and you should be able to spot it. Uh, it's about 15 light minutes away from us. Now, Mars isn't the only planet that's up tonight. In fact, there's a much brighter and more prominently visible planet uh, right in front of it, setting in the west, and that is the planet Venus. Uh, let's get a closer look at Venus. Now, Venus will be the brightest object in our night sky in the early evening tonight. So bright you'll even see it before the sun finishes setting. Now, Venus has been getting higher in the sky each evening for the past few months, uh, and in May it will reach its uh, highest point in the western sky, uh, and where, where it's furthest from sunset, and then it will start trending lower as we move into June. Uh, this is called its greatest elongation, uh, and let's uh, take a look uh, at that. So here's a chart showing us the position of Venus as it's been changing um, and you can see here in January, uh, it was fairly bright and full, and it's been slowly getting more and more bright, moving higher in the sky. And its phase has also been changing, too, you'll notice. Its elongation will be on June 4th, so at the end of this month, uh, we'll be um, at its uh, highest point. Actually, a couple days before that, I'm not sure why this chart says June, but uh, right around the end of this month, uh, Venus will be at its highest point, and then it will be... Uh, getting lower and lower, getting closer to us, but getting less bright as more of it's in shadow. So you can see Venus has phases here, just like the moon, and that's because Venus is closer to the sun than the Earth is. And right now Venus is about half full, uh, and at its elongation, at its highest point, uh, it will be exactly half full in sort of a third quarter phase, just like the moon's phases. Um, so check out Venus for sure. It'll be shining very prominently in the western sky and setting a couple hours after sunset. All right, let's continue over to our southern sky, and although the memorial is beautiful, uh, as I often do, I am going to move us to a bit more rural view so we can see stars closer to the horizon. Uh, the moon is shining brightly tonight in a waxing gibbous phase. Waxing means that it's currently getting bigger and brighter, and gibbous means that it's more than half full. Uh, the next full moon Looks like it'll be in about four or five days. Now, there is a famous star pattern uh, that is over in the southeast right now called the Spring Triangle. Now, it is spring officially, uh, and before we had calendars and other ways of tracking the dates, uh, ancient people used the stars. And there's a star pattern here that uh, you can use to figure out when spring is arriving. It's made of three bright stars that form a nearly perfect equilateral triangle over here. Uh, and as these stars start to rise in the early evening, you can tell that spring is approaching. And on the day that all three stars appear after sunset, you can tell that spring is here. And as we're uh, well into spring, you can see they're already pretty high after sunset. Uh, the first star is called Denebola. And this star, um, its name means Tail of the Lion. And it's part of a lion constellation named Leo the Lion. 
Leo represents the Nemean lion. This was the ferocious beast that Hercules fought and defeated during the first of his 12 labors. Uh, the brightest star in Leo is at a, the front of the constellation here. Uh, it's called Regulus, which means Little King. Uh, we also have this star down... Oh, I'll actually go to this star over here. This star's name is Arcturus. Uh, it's the second brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere. It's part of a constellation that looks kind of like an ice cream cone, or maybe I'm just hungry. Uh, the constellation's name is Buotes, and he was a legendary hunter or shepherd. Uh, Arcturus means watcher of the bear in ancient Greek, and in some myths uh, it is said that this constellation was uh, hunting the bears, either to protect his flock or uh, to capture them for himself. And then we have uh, this last star down here. It's called Spica, and it's part of a constellation named Virgo the Maiden. This one's fun. It looks like a big stick figure. In fact, the moon is Virgo's head tonight. So here is Virgo's head. Here are her arms. Here's her torso and her legs. Now this star's name is Spica, which means ear of grain in Latin, and in many artistic, artistic depictions, Virgo is shown as holding an ear of grain. Uh, Virgo often represented a goddess of fertility and harvest. Uh, the Greeks called her Demeter, the Romans called her Ceres. So those three stars, uh, again, uh, Denebola, Arcturus, and Spica form the Spring Triangle. Uh, you can use a nifty trick to remember Arcturus and Spiga. Uh, first, you need to find the Big Dipper, the seven bright stars over in the north. And if you draw an arc through the handle of the Big Dipper, that arc will sort of pass through these two stars. And to help you remember this, there's a little saying that goes along with it. It goes, arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spica. Again, from the handle of the Big Dipper, simply arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spica. And you can easily find and remember those two stars. All right, we'll take a quick breather. If anybody has any questions or comments, throw those in the comment section now. Uh, and Jerry says, another question answered. I noticed this last night. I noticed Venus, I'm assuming you're talking about. Awesome. Uh, it's always fun to spot a planet in our, in our night sky. We've also got Larian tuning in from New Smyrna Beach. Hope you're doing well. Uh, and Eric watching from New, New Smyrna Beach as well. Thanks for watching, both of you. I hope you enjoy tonight's show. Uh, and I hope the weather down there is nice and warm. Give the dogs a scratch for me. Alrighty, y'all. I think we'll go ahead and... Oops. I'll go ahead and accidentally knock down my uh, lens cover. There we go. And we'll go ahead and move into our What's Up stream uh, for current events. Let's see what's been going on uh, in our... Oops. Uh, in in uh, space and astronomy news. And the first story for today is an exciting one that involves an RUD. Uh, for long-time watchers of the show, you may remember what an RUD is. Uh, and this will be our little mini deep dive for today. And there was a very important rocket launch that happened fairly recently. Uh, and that was the launch of SpaceX's Starship Mega Rocket. Uh, this giant rocket blasted off from Boca Chica, Texas uh, on the early morning of April 20th. Uh, and it was a spectacular launch for many reasons. Now, this uh, rocket is now in the record books for uh, as being the biggest, tallest, and most powerful rocket ever to take flight. Uh, now, this was a test flight. No humans or cargo was on board of this. They were just testing the launch systems. Um, different parts of this system has been in testing, and you've probably, if you've watched this stream before, you've uh, been following along with those news updates. Uh, but this is the first time the full rocket was tested, uh, and it was intended to be a test flight going into space, uh, and it was a partial success, which we'll get into. Now, uh, this test flight, SpaceX wanted to see how far they could take this rocket, uh, and the rocket lasted nearly four minutes, uh, which still represents an incredible accomplishment. Now, the rocket cleared the launch tower and managed to survive max Q, uh, which is the maximum dynamic pressure, high, uh, maximum, maximum dynamic pressure, uh, the greatest aerodynamic pressure that the rocket uh, achieves as it accelerates and uh, starts moving out of the atmosphere. There's a point where the atmosphere starts to thin as it gets faster and the pressure lowers, but there's a point where the, it is max, uh, it, Experiencing maximum pressure, and that is called max Q. Uh, and you can see the rocket igniting. So the Starship uh, at, was at the top, and this Mega Booster was at the bottom. Starship in black and Mega Booster in white. Uh, and 
Um, now, immediately, uh, things weren't going exactly as planned. So um, after launch, the uh, flight engineers immediately noticed that a number of the uh, engines weren't fully functioning. Uh, now, there are a lot of engines, as you can see. So, um, you know, they do account for some engine failures. Um, but uh, pretty quickly, the rocket started to exhibit pretty er erratic behavior and even did a couple somersaults uh, before uh, being uh, self-destructed on purpose, basically. It was about 37 miles above the Gulf of Mexico when it started to uh, lose control. Uh, the Carmen line, which is generally... Uh, agreed upon as being sort of the edge of space is 62 miles so it didn't get to space unfortunately so as the rocket ascended uh, there were several bright flashes that appeared uh, at the base of the super heavy booster uh, and this was a sign that some of these engines these raptor engines were fizzling out uh, as many as three of them failed after the first 15 seconds and another four or five failed uh, uh, after a little bit later into this short mention mission but you can see the rocket did take off and uh was pretty stable at first although it did sort of list sideways um which uh is not great um but you know it's going up at least <laughs> um uh, but as i said at three minutes and 59 seconds uh spacex was forced to end the mission um, by uh, purposefully detonating it. Now, there were a number of issues with this launch, uh, which we'll get into, but as you can see, uh, there were a lot of rocks flying out from the launch pad, some of them uh, hitting this uh, journalist's van. Uh, whoops. Um, and uh, a lot of the launch pad was destroyed. I actually have uh, another photo of this. Oops, which I, of course, closed. Let me pull that back up. Um, yeah, so uh, here's a photo um, of the launch pad that was a bit destroyed. So uh, prior to the launch, SpaceX officials decided to skip uh, the installation of a flame diverter, uh, which um, would have avoided this destruction. They figured that the concrete pad under the launch pad could withstand the pressure. It did not, clearly. Um, they did a static fire test, but it was only at 50% thrust, so uh, unfortunately 100% thrust did not work too well. Now they are working on a massive water-cooled steel plate to go into the launch mount, which will divert the pressure from the next launch. NASA has used that for its space shuttle launch uh, missions, and they also use a lot of water to uh, actually reduce the vibration pressure. So uh, SpaceX will be working on this. Uh, in fact, uh, Elon says that they will be hopefully ready to launch in one or two months. So we'll see if that happens. There's uh, some spectacular video of the mega rocket uh, doing somersaults in space. You can see the graphic here that uh, not all the en engines were working, but it was still quite spectacular. Um, but it, uh, it was still considered a successful mission. Um, and in that there's a lot of new data to be uh, gleaned from this uh, launch and um, you know there we're still planning on using this rocket so you know NASA has a vested interest in the Starship system and SpaceX uh, the space agency is planning on using uh, this rocket uh, as pretty much uh, a oops a uh, transport system uh, to get us back to the moon. It's actually under contract, under a $4 billion contract with the U.S. government uh, to be a part of the upcoming Artemis 3 and 4 moon landing missions, which are scheduled for 2025 and 2028, respectively. Uh, and after this launch uh, and rapid unscheduled disassembly, as they say, uh, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson comment, or cemented his confidence in SpaceX bouncing back from this RUD, stating that the explosion was, quote, not a big downer in the way that SpaceX does things. So there's a vote of confidence. Space is hard, and a lot of the early Apollo missions ended in explosions, too. So um, hopefully we're just one step closer to getting back to the moon. Uh, let's check back into the comments. We've got Katya watching from Overland Park, Kansas. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Now, Geraldine's also saying good evening and thank you for this stream. Uh, thank you for watching and thanks for everyone tuning in tonight. Got a couple more interesting news stories to go over. Let's take a look at this one. Speaking of reusable rockets uh, and a space race uh, and a uh, website that does not want to load. There we go. Um, China inches closer to SpaceX technology with its successful vertical landing demo. Uh, so let's take a look at this video, if it works. Uh, this is coming from CIS Space, which is partly owned by the Canadian Academy of Sciences. They recently flew a very small rocket, um, relatively speaking, uh, 
as part of a test flight uh, for a reusable landing. Just like SpaceX uses its Falcon 9 rocket and reuses it when it uh, gracefully lands back on the Earth or on its ocean barge, China is hoping to do the same thing, and they uh, did uh, built a rocket prototype. This one weighed about 200 pounds and is powered by two engines, including a turbojet engine that simulates the kind of variable thrust, a liquid rocket engine that's used during vertical landings. Uh, now, this rocket did take off uh, and hover for a while and come back down. It flew uh, no higher than about 3,000 feet or 1,000 meters before the uh, before a reverse engine thrust enabled it to hover back down onto the awaiting C class platform. This test lasted uh, about 10 minutes, uh, but the demonstration could eventually lead to rocket stage reusability, similar to how SpaceX does it. So there's a wide view there showing that successful test. Uh, SpaceX became a pro, of course, at landing its boosters upright, uh, the first time being in 2015. Uh, where they performed a successful landing for the first time following a year of trial and error. Uh, the rocket's first stage uses thrust to control its descent, landing on four legs made of carbon fiber. Today, the Falcon 9 rocket regularly lands on a drone ship at sea. Uh, now, earlier this year in January, and the NASA Administrator Bill Nelson told journalists, quote, It's a fact. We're in a space race with China. Uh, so the next space race is heating up, and China looks to be uh, itching to enter it. Uh, in other international news, we've got some good news from one of our longtime partners. Uh, Russia is promising to continue working on the International Space Station uh, up through 2028. Now, Russia had previously threatened to leave the International Space Station by 2024, but it is now the last of NASA's partners to agree to stay aboard the station for a few more years. Uh, NASA, in this press release, announced that its Russian counterpart has, quote, confirmed it will support continued station operations through 2028, uh, they wrote in this blog post. And uh, Russia was the last to sign on to an extended operations uh, deal, uh, along with other countries like Japan and Canada, as well as participating countries in the European Space Agency. Those countries have uh, all agreed to continue supporting station operations until 2030, when the ISS is already due to retire. Russia, it should be said, is planning on building its own space station in low Earth orbit, uh, the Russian orbital space station, nicknamed Ross, which uh, is set to launch in two phases. The first phase, which the first phase, which they hope to launch in 2025. So another aspect of the space race heating up. Russia is wanting their own space station as well. I should mention China is already in the process of building a space station for themselves. Now, NASA and Roscosmos have a long-standing partnership aboard the ISS for more than two decades. Uh, in fact, there has been at least one NASA astronaut and one Russian cosmonaut on board the space station at all times since ISS launched in 1998. But the Russian Space Agency has not always been on its best behavior, uh, aggressively retaliating against Western sanctions imposed against Russia in light of the recent invasion of Ukraine. Uh, in fact, in July 2022, a former Roscosmos head, Dmitry Rogozin, uh, commanded the cosmonauts on board the International Space Station to actually discontinue their work on a European robotic arm, challenging ESA's Director General Josef Akbakar to, quote, fly to space and do it himself. So there you go. There's your international space relations for you. Now, with Russia leaving in 2028 uh, and with ISS hanging out until 2030, NASA and its partners uh, will have to manage the station on their own. They use a Russian spacecraft to maneuver the ISS uh, to keep it in orbit, so we'll have to figure out a game plan to do that for another couple of years if we plan on doing it till uh, 2030. It was meant to retire in 2024, but uh, we recently extended uh, its lifetime. So um, they are working on designing new space stations and a moon station uh, that will hopefully be uh, going into space in the near future. Alrighty. Oh, another bit of news that you've probably uh, heard about over the past month. This one popped up in a couple of news stories. Uh, there was a defunct satellite that uh, re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. Now, there was some doom and gloom reporting about this, but nobody was hurt. I'll say right off the bat. Uh, right off the bat. Uh, so, in mid-April, NASA announced that its retired satellite, RETSI, uh, which is a uh, solar spectros spectroscopic imager, uh, was going to uh, re-enter Earth's atmosphere. Uh, this satellite launched in 2002 on a mission to monitor solar flares. It uh, 
observed more than 75,000 of them on its 16-year mission. Uh, but its mission concluded in 2018, and it's been a st in a stable low Earth orbit ever since. But its orbit was slowly degrading as atmospheric drag tugged on the spacecraft, gradually lowering its orbit until it finally met its fiery demise. Uh, it likely burned up during its re-entry on April 19th, and there are no reports yet of any debris falling to the Earth's surface. NASA said in a statement, quote, The Department of Defense confirmed that the 660-pound spacecraft re-entered the atmosphere over the Sahara Desert region at approximately 26 degrees longitude and 21 degrees latitude. Now, the space agency, quote, expected most of the spacecraft to burn up as it traveled through the atmosphere, but for some components to survive re-entry. Uh, earlier, NASA had said that the risk of harm to people on the ground was approximately 1 in 2,467, which is a very specific statistic, but I'll trust the scientists. All right, let's move our gaze out into our solar system and see what's been going on. Actually, this is a story from her, uh, down here on Earth about the solar system, and but it's a pretty cool one. The NASA scientists have successfully extracted oxygen from simulated moon dirt, or soil, I should say. Sorry, Dad. Uh, during a recent test at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, scientists were able to produce oxygen from the soil in a vacuum environment for the first time, uh, they announced uh, just a few days ago, in fact. So uh, using a high-powered laser that simulated heat from a solar energy concentrator, which is similar to a magnifying glass, uh, the team melted the solar soil simulant. Uh, and after the soil was heated, the scientists detected carbon monoxide using uh, the Mass Spectrometer Observing Lunar Operations instrument, which is a device that was designed to help scientists look for water on the moon. Uh, this technology has the potential to produce several uh, times its own weight in oxygen per year on the lunar surface, which will enable sustained human presence uh, and a lunar economy. Uh, whoops. So, uh, pretty exciting stuff. Creating oxygen on the moon could help support lunar habitats for future astronauts as NASA and other space agencies strive to establish a sustainable presence on and around the, Earth, the surface of Earth's satellite. Oh, pretty cool stuff. Jerry says, could you explain the concept of Max-Q again? Thank you. Absolutely, Jerry. So, when a rocket is blasting off, um, it's accelerating. It starts at speed zero, basically, but it starts getting faster and faster. And as an object accelerates, the pressure uh, that it encounters also increases. But two things are happening when a rocket is blasting up. And not only is it slowly getting faster, accelerating, but it's also going up. Now, as you go farther up uh, on Earth uh, in the atmosphere, the atmosphere gets thinner. So there are two competing forces happening. Basically, the Earth, the rocket is getting faster and faster, but the air is getting thinner and thinner. And so there's this point um, where the pressure uh, reaches its maximum point and it starts uh, getting uh, lower. It starts uh, it's, it starts getting relieved because the air or the atmosphere is getting thinner. Um, so you can kind of imagine like a bell curve where the pressure is increasing, increasing, increasing until the air gets thin enough where it starts to decrease. Uh, and uh, after that point, we kind of feel like the rocket's probably good. So max Q is kind of an extreme point um, where uh, where if the rocket passes that, uh, then you are uh, probably good. Uh, here's another fun fact, though, um, I should mention. But uh, uh, max Q is also the name of the world's only all astronaut band. <laughs> That's right. There was... Uh, a, a group of astronauts who were also musicians who got together and formed a, a band, uh, and they called themselves Max Q. It was a bit of a short-lived band, uh, but still pretty cool uh, to uh, have heard them performed. It's the, like I said, the world's only astronaut-only band. Uh, also, Max Q is just a cool name. Uh, I think that's Chris Hatfield right there, actually, if I had to guess. Um, most likely, he was he's a very famous guitar-playing astronaut with also a very famous uh, mustache. So there you go. Uh, two explanations for Max Q. Hope you enjoyed that. Jerry, I hope that answered your question as well. Uh, by the way, Crystal in the comments gives three hands up emojis. I hope that means you're excited for tonight's stream, Crystal. Thanks for watching tonight. All right, a couple more news tidbits to throw out there. Let's take a look at this. Here's a fun uh, thing you can experiment with at home. Um, and let's see if I can uh, copy and paste a link to this. Uh, for you to play with yourself, but this is um, a, a brand new release from NASA, and this is the uh, uh, a, a what's well, a compilation of 100 
10,000 images uh, that offers the most comprehensive portrait of the red planet yet. So Mars has just released this interactive map of Mars made of over 100,000 images taken by the agency's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, or MRO, uh, which has been circling the red planet for 17 years. This mosaic is the highest resolution global portrait of Mars ever made. Uh, the map can, uh, is the creation of scientists at the Murray Laboratory for Planetary Visualization uh, at the California Institute of Technology. It comprises 5.7 trillion pixels and it offers a sweeping black and white look at Mars. It's a tremendous amount of data, so I should warn you, if you try to open this on your computer, uh, it may uh, bring your uh, computer to its knees, so just keep that in mind. Uh, it is a bit of an intense visualization, but it is a fun visualization with a lot of uh, uh, cool tools as well as uh, popular shortcuts. Um, so let's see if uh, we can find... So there are a couple of filters here. Uh, you can look at uh, some named features um, and uh, let's turn that off. And we can also look at maps of rover traversals. So for example, let's go over to the Curiosity rover. Let's take a look at that uh, rover and it'll also show its uh, trail. Jerry says, thanks for the explanation. You're welcome, Jerry. Thanks for the great question. All right, so zooming in. Uh, this also has terrain, terrain data uh, as well, which is very fun. Uh, so there you go. So there is um, Mount Sharp uh, next to Gale Crater, and this is the path of Curiosity. Uh, Curiosity started down here. If I click on one of these waypoints, it'll show us um, the day of its journey. Uh, this was Sol 22, uh, for example. That is the 22nd Martian day. We call them Sols. Uh, and uh, if we click on that, there's Sol Zero. That's where Curiosity started its journey. And over the past 10 years, it's been roving along, uh, roving around Gale Crater. So we can zoom out here and see the whole crater. And it's slowly moving up Mount Sharp, uh, aiming to uh, head up the mountain and get as far as it can get, really. So play, well, play around with that visualization, uh, but do load it on your computer at your own risk. <laughs> uh, let's go back over here. All right, speaking of Mars, here's an update uh, from the Perseverance rover. Uh, and uh, now, uh, a little while ago, um, back in February of last year, actually, uh, Perseverance got a pet, uh, a pet rock, uh, which uh, I don't believe they ever officially named, but we'll call it Wilson. Um, <laughs> on February 25th, uh, this pet rock was discovered in an image captured uh, of the rover's wheel. This rock sort of got stuck in the wheel. Um, this rock spent a total of 427 Martian days cradled inside the wheel, traveling around six miles across the Martian terrain. But unfortunately, uh, this rock has now moved on. Perseverance has parted ways with this lumpy stone that has been its companion for over a year. In a, a recently captured image, we saw that the rock has finally escaped. Uh, it, this was sad news confirmed by this uh, Twitter user, Gwinnell uh, Caravaca, who is a planetary geologist at NASA's Mars Science Laboratory, who bid farewell to Percy's pet rock here. Uh, this rock can, uh, gained somewhat of a cult following, apparently. Uh, the fans re have reacted to this news by comparing the rock to Wilson, the famous uh, volleyball that became Tom Hanks' companion in the movie Castaway. Unfortunately, Wilson has parted ways with Perseverance. Uh, so uh, Perseverance does still have a companion on Mars, though. Don't you worry, because... Uh, the helicopter Ingenuity is still on Mars and still flying around. This tiny helicopter uh, arrived with the rover a few years ago, and uh, it recently logged its 50th flight on the surface of Mars, which uh, it was originally only planned to perform five short hops. So uh, Perseverance and Ingenuity are still roving around, even though that rock has moved on. All right, just two more news topics to cover today. So if you have any last minute comments or questions, let me know. Uh, and we'll be wrapping up here shortly. Uh, and let's talk about the outer solar system and a mission called JUICE that just began. Uh, JUICE stands for the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer. And this historic mission uh, just began. Uh, this highly anticipated mission to Jupiter uh, officially uh, went underway as uh, the Ariane 5 rocket successfully delivered the probe to space uh, just a few uh, weeks ago. 
This craft will now begin an eight-year journey through the solar system to reach uh, the icy moons of Jupiter, uh, and that may host some form of life. Um, now, uh, the liftoff be uh, began or happened on April 14th, uh, and separation of the Juice uh, probe was confirmed shortly after. They are having some mission or some issues with the antenna fully deploying, um, but. Um, uh, hopefully those will get worked out and the spacecraft is expected to arrive uh, at the gas giant system in 2031 where it will uh, focus on studying three of Jupiter's mini moons which are Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Uh, the reason why those three moons uh, were uh, selected uh, is uh, out of Jupiter's approximately 90 moons is because these three moons may host subsurface oceans below their icy surfaces. And scientists, of course, are curious about their ability to host primitive life. We know for sure that Europa has an ocean below its icy surface, and Ganymede and Cluster are suspect, suspected to have some as well. Uh, Juice will spend nine months orbiting Ganymede, uh, one of the uh, largest moons in our solar system. Actually, it, the largest moon in our solar system. Uh, and it'll also be the first time any moon beyond our own has been orbited by a spacecraft. Pretty cool stuff. And one last bit of good news about our exploration of the solar system, and this is our final news topic for today, um, but NASA has hacked the Voyager 2 probe to hopefully make it last even longer. Now the Voyager 2 probe pictured here uh, back, uh, well there's a test model pictured here in uh, the 1970s, uh, is a probe that's 12 billion miles away from Earth right now. It's so far away in fact that it takes 22 hours for NASA's signals to reach this probe. Now, with Voyager's uh, power gradually diminishing over the past few decades, mission planners thought that they might have to shut down one of its five scientific instruments next year to keep it going. However, a newly implemented plan has resulted in a, a welcomed delay to that plan. Uh, and that plan is uh, to uh, do sort of some creative hacking with its uh, safety system. So essentially, generators on board both Voyager probes uh, lose power each year as the result of continual uh, decay processes. Now, this hasn't affected their science gathering, but mission planners have had to turn off heaters and other non-essential systems to compensate for the ongoing power loss. For Voyager 2, it was getting to a stage where one scientific instrument was probably going to need to be turned off soon, as early as next year. But as a result of this new implemented hack, Voyager 2 is now using a small amount of backup power provision, provision for an onboard safety mechanism designed to protect the craft from potential damaging voltage spikes. So the probe is stealing some of this juice, not a lot, but just enough to keep all five of its scientific instruments active until at least 2026, according to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, NASA Voyager uh, project scientist Linda Sp uh, Spilker says, quote, the science data that the Voyagers are returning gets more valuable the farther away from the sun they go. So we are definitely interested in keeping as many science instruments operating as long as possible. One of the greatest achievements in space flight history uh, just got an extension, which is incredible considering that uh, these probes have been going for more than 45 years and hopefully they'll be going for many years more. Oh, and uh, I just noticed that Jerry asks, nothing new from James Webb. Thank you so much, Jerry. I totally skipped over um, the most important, uh, most important stop on today's show. This will be our final, uh, our final news topic. And yes, of course, we do have a Webb watch for today. And it's just going to be a cool photo uh, that um, Webb just took. Uh, now, uh, this photo that you're seeing right now is from the Hubble Space Telescope. But I'm about to show you a comparison, but for some context. Now let's, uh, let's start at the beginning uh, of this story, which is about uh, 340 uh, years ago, which is when a brilliant light appeared in Earth's night sky as a distant star died in an ex enormous explosion. Now this light, which we now know as Supernova Cassiopeia A, has just been captured in a never-before-seen detail by the Webb Space Telescope. Uh, this supernova may have been documented as early as six, uh, 1680 by astronomer John Flamsteed, but it was its uh, discovery was made official in 1947 by radio astronomers in Cambridge. It's the strongest radio source in the sky beyond our solar system, uh, and it's a uh, and as such, it's a favorite uh, observational target for radio observers. Now, this image was taken by Hubble in 2004, uh, but watch as we reveal the Hubble Space Telescope or the Webb Space Telescope's uh, new uh, vision of this 
uh, supernova. So there you go. There's the image compared to Hubble. And you can see quite a bit more detail. So this web image, translated from infrared to visible wavelengths, uh, shows the outer rim of this 10 light year wide remnant in deep orange, signifying the presence of warm dust produced when stellar material came in contact with material around the star. Towards the center of the image are heavier elements from the deceased star, including oxygen, argon, and neon, as well as some dust. Uh, what's more, nearly 20 years between Hubble and Webb shows the expansion of the nebula in the aftermath of this stellar explosion. So if you look closely, comparing them, you can see Webb's vision is bigger. It's sort of bubbled outwards because this explosion is still happening, basically. This nebula is still expanding, and we can actually see that expansion almost in real time comparing these two images. Pretty incredible. Now Webb sees the cosmos in infrared, while uh, the much older Hubble sees it in ultraviolet, and infrared imagery lets us look back in time, much further than this 300-year-old uh, supernova, but all the way to the dawn of our universe. Webb launched in December 2021, and it's been producing scientific images of the cosmos since July 2022. Uh, and uh, Cassiopeia may be a young object to image, but it still is going to reveal some amazing secrets about the cosmos, no doubt. So thank you, Jerry, for reminding me of our web watch. And that is a great place to wrap up uh, tonight's stream. Thank you so much for everybody who tuned in and commented. It was a pretty active stream for being a slow Monday. Uh, so I appreciate everybody watching. And Casey says, I just love the quality of the images we are getting from the James Webb Space Telescope. Me too. It's pretty incredible. And I, all, I also love being, comparing it to Hubble, which is still a pretty spectacular image. But it's amazing how far technology has come. We've got Jerry saying incredible. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks for watching and for your great questions. And we've got James and Donna who says the new web picture is just so cool. I totally agree. And hopefully next month we'll have some new images of web to reveal as well as other exciting news stories. Uh, but we're going to start wrapping up tonight's stream. Thank you to everybody tuning in uh, to tonight's stream. And uh, we'll have uh, one last uh, send off from our stream mascot, Phoebe. Uh, say hello to everyone, Phoebe. Don't forget that if you're watching on Union Station's Facebook page, be sure to head on over to the Planetarium's Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash kcplanetarium. Like and subscribe to us there. Head over to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash kcplanetarium, uh, where you can find recordings of all of our past 92 other streams. Stay tuned for announcements. We're coming up on 100, and we definitely want to celebrate an amazing accomplishment. So many shows, uh, and uh, we are... <laughs> there you go, Phoebe. Oh. Not interested in the treat. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> and uh, we are excited to see where the rest of the year takes us. So thanks for watching, everybody. Casey says, thank you again for continuing to do these streams. Always the highlight of the month. Derek says, great job. Jerry says, see you soon. We will see you all back at the Planetarium as well. Stay tuned. We'll be announcing the return of our star tours and other programs at the end of this month. Jenny says, thanks. Thanks for watching, Jenny. Ooh, big fluff from Phoebe. Uh, and Teresa says, thank you, Patrick. Thanks for watching, Teresa. Thank you so much. Uh, I have been your planetarium manager, Patrick Hess, uh, and thank you to all of our continued watchers and returning watchers and first-time watchers. Hope you have an amazing rest of your month, everyone, and we will see you next time. Say goodbye, Phoebe. Scratch. Bye, everybody. Wow. Scratch. Good job, Phoebe. <gasps> Whoa, 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 whoa. No? Yeah. Okay, Phoebe says goodbye. Scratch. Scratch. Good bird. Bye, everybody.